Okay. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. So as you may know, the talk tonight will be in English. So you'll have the delight to have my English. It's awful. Warning. Um, before starting the event with Noemi, I will just take a short moment to present the WebMD and people working for the WebMD. This will be quick, don't be over. Um, WebMD tonight. The intro, this is what we are doing right now. After the intro, we have the, the talk of Noemi. Then I will present you what's next, what's the next WebMD, what's the next event we will held uh, in Lausanne, if I remember well. We will have an open mic session, so this is the moment you can come here to say something to everybody here. For example, if you're looking for a job, uh, if you're looking for someone working with you on open source, if you're looking for people in your company, I don't know, whatever. Don't be shy, this is the time to bribe, maybe. We have a kahoot, does some people never played kahoot here? By hand? One person, okay. No, don't worry, I will explain the kahoot before playing the kahoot. We have three gifts tonight. The gifts have been chosen by Noemi, and they will she will explain what the gifts oh, are I'm after. Oh. After, after, don't worry. Uh, those gifts are pretty awesome, so thanks. Thank you very much for this gift. You well, really didn't research nothing. And then we'll have an apero. You don't have to stay for the apero, but you're welcome to stay for the apero. This will be, it will be on the next room where you enter. As you see, I have a microphone. We live stream every event of the WebMD. Uh, you are not on the camera, don't worry. But we have someone that takes pictures during the event. So if you be on those pictures, just tell us, come to me or come to anybody from the WebMD team. We can remove you from the pictures or, or we, we will try to don't select pictures where you, are, where you are. So just drop us an email if you prefer to be anonymous or just come by to me uh, during the upper time and we will try to not have you on the pictures. So the WebMD team. Many people work for the WebMD. Uh, we have Nelson here. He's, he's behind the camera tonight. He's handling the live streaming. Justine is not here with us tonight. She helps for the communication and for the streaming too. Margot and Alexia, both of them already see them, I think, because they welcome you for this event tonight. Uh, Asia, she takes pictures. She's the person that will take pictures of you, maybe. Alena and Oli are not here tonight too. They're hi. They organize uh, the projects of the WebMD on Holy, especially the communication of the WebMD. So every tweet you see on the WebMD is like maybe, so I don't know, eight years ago. So the sponsors, the boring moments. This, this is the people that give money to the WebMD. Maybe one day we have your logo on this slide, who knows. So our gold sponsors are Idora, cloud hosting company like Infomaniac, if you know. Uh, we also have Infomaniac, obviously. Superheat and Leap, both agency in Lausanne, and Leap in the whole Switzerland, I would say. And our bronze sponsor, CPNV, this is a school, maybe you know it from Yverdon. And Jobtrex, this is a company that plus internship and apprentice in company. Our partners, they don't give us money, but they give us something else, stickers or gifts for our attendees. JetBrains, uh, DevOps Geneva, <coughs> uh, Dev, DevOps Day, sorry, <laughs> and uh, Smashing Magazine. We have some stickers from Smashing Magazine on the Apple room. Thank you to, for Cospi to Cospire. I know something from Cospire is here tonight, right? Okay. Oh, well, I'm also, I also work. You're, you're right, you're right, you're right. I just never show up. Do you want to say something um, about the Cospire? I can, yeah. Okay, you do. I don't know if I'm ready, but. Welcome you to your stage. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sophie. I work at Cospire. Um, Janan and Lucio are the co-founders, but they aren't here today. But Cospire is a great co-working space. There's many different packages, like five-day passes. We can do day passes even if you want to just try out the space. So you can come as you wish. And I don't know which package you're on, actually. But well, I only did domiciliation. Ah, OK. That's so another option. I yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's but also an option. Is yeah. Up, I'm, I'm happy to show up. Yes, <laughs> and I know th um, they're starting to have more and more events. I actually host some events here as well myself, so it's super cool to be here. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. So is it your turn now? Hi. Yeah. Cool. Nelson does the microphone. Has been switched. 
you kind of stop here. Et ben non plus quoi. Euh... Ah ok. Je pense. Moi je pense c'est bon. Check my time on time. Yes. The developer is in charge. Uh, two minutes. Awesome. Well. All good. Hmm. I gotta sweat. Cool. So thank you guys. Um, as Kevin said, my name is Noemi, and I'm the founder of a small company called. Which is actually based here, although only in the Maybox. Um, but we're not going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about ADHD, Attention Deficit um, Hyperactivity Disorder, which is something that I know a lot ab ab about because I have it. And um, we're also going to talk about creativity and all how those two things are actually connected. But first, uh, yeah, I wanted to say, so I did my best, you know, to make a presentation that is well structured and easy to understand. But you know, I have ADHD, so it might go a bit, a little bit in every direction. So if you're lost, just tell me, okay, and I'll, I'll be happy to kind of explain what I've I've been meaning to say. So I've divided today's presentation into two parts. First, we're going to talk about what ADHD is and what kind of symptoms and how it affects my in general, and then we're going to talk about how it can make uh, us ADHDers more creative. Before we start, I just wanted to give you a quick definition of this word, neur neurotypical. Anybody knows what it means? Yeah, not a lot of people. I use this word a lot in the presentation, so I just wanted to make sure you understand what it means. Basically, when I refer to someone that is neurotypical, it means someone who's normal. So someone who doesn't have ADHD or any other type of neurodivergence. So if you're not, you don't have ADHD, you're not autistic or any other type of neurodivergence, then you're a neurotypical. So what is ADHD? Um, so it is actually a neurological condition, meaning that our brain was al is altered compared to a neurotypical brain and it works differently. And you know, a lot of people think that ADHD is a mental illness, but it's not actually. Just like autism, uh, it's not a disease and it's not a mental illness. So you do not develop ADHD in your life. You're born with it. And you know, your, your brain is just this way. So it's gonna be like this for your entire life. You cannot cure it. You cannot prevent it. Um, and Often we see little kids that have ADHD are very hyperactive and rather annoying even. And you know, we tend to blame the parents like thinking, you know, your kid is so annoying. Can't you just, you know, parent them into s staying calm a little bit? But that's not the problem, you know, it's not a parenting issue. It's just if the kids have ADHD, their brain works differently and that affects them. So you can cure it, although for ADHD, um, there is medication which can help manage some of the symptoms, but I'm, I'm actually not taking any. We can talk about that later. That's not really the point now. I came across a um, study recently and they had studied the brain from more than 3000 people with ADHD. And they noticed that overall, of people with ADHD is a little bit smaller than the neurotypical brain. So you can actually see it on an MRI scan. Not only that, but apparently five sec very specific brains are a little bit smaller than in a uh, neurotypical brain. And I think this is pretty cool because I hope that in the future we can use this brain imaging to help diagnose ADHD because right now it's a very tough process to go through. And there's actually a lot of uh, sexism involved. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about that a bit later. Um, ADHD affects about 7% of the population. Um, and it doesn't discriminate in the sense that it affects, you know, 7% of men, 7% of women, regardless of you know, uh, gender or race or how you grew up or what part of the world, there's absolutely no evidence that suggests that a particular group of people might have more case of ADHD than other people. 
However, um, we diagnose way more men with ADHD than we do for women. And that is because all the research that is done is basically done on men. So we know how men present with symptoms, but we're less aware of how women do. So when they show symptoms, they're easily diagnosed with something else at first, at least. But anyway, my point is the prevalence is the same. So it affects about 7% of men and 7% of women, just like non-binary people, transgender people. There's just absolutely no group more affected. Another thing I wanted to say, so ADHD is a type of neurodivergence. Um, so there are more neurodivergence, they're basically trouble that, well, disorders that affect the brain. Um, so those are the main types of neurodivergence that they recognize in Switzerland today. Uh, there are three, we're gonna be talking about ADHD. There's also autism and um, what they call HP in French, so high intellectual potential. Interesting to know, the only type of neurodivergence that actually has an impact on people's IQ is this one. If you fall into this category, it means that your, uh, your IQ is above 130. So that means you're very smart. For the other troubles like autism or ADHD, there's absolutely no link with IQ. Very often we think that people with autism can be you know, excessively smart. Some of them are, but you know, just like people with ADHD, they can be they can have an IQ that's lower than average, uh, average or higher. There's no, there's no correlation there. And actually, there are more trouble than those. Those are the main ones. But I think in the U.S. right now, they recognize at least ten. So they also include dyslexia, uh, then Down syndrome, and a few others. As for me, I'm here. So what does that mean? So I have ADHD, uh, but I also have a lot of autistic traits. Actually, the reason I put them in the Venn diagram is because very often um, some symptoms of ADHD, like people show symptoms of different of those trouble. Like, and of often ADHD and autism come together, which seems to be my case. So although I was not labeled as autistic, I have a lot of autistic behaviors. Um, yeah, which is actually a good thing because as when you have ADHD, you tend to be very disorganized and forget stuff. But when you're autistic, often you have very rigid structure in place. So it kind of helps me, you know, counterbalance those things. Um, in short, ADHD is caused by a lack of dopamine in the brain. Um, I'm simply because it's more complex than that. But in short, it's linked to a problem with dopamine. So what is dopamine? Um, it's a neurotransmitter, meaning it's, it's a substance that your brain creates and it helps the neurons in your brain communicate together. So if you lack this, then the, the, your brain cells can't communicate properly. Uh, and it's, uh, indeed all we know about ADHD is that, you know, the neurotransmitter involved is dopamine, but we have more than one neurotransmitter. Obviously we also have serotonin, for example, which seems to be linked with autism, but it's definitely dopamine that it's linked with ADHD. And you know, dopamine plays a role in attention, motivation, memory, emotions, movement, and a lot of other things. So as a result, People with ADHD have problems with attention, motivation, memory, emotion, movement, and a lot of other things. Now, what does that mean for me? Um, in terms of attention, you know that little voice in your head that you have when you're talking to yourself? Like, you know, when you think, oh, it's been a while since I called my mom, I should call my mom. Do you guys have an internal monologue like that? Well, here's the problem. I have five. <laughs> they're always talking together at the same time and they never shut up and it's like there's also music you know in the background that I don't really know where it comes from and they just never ever shut up so to give you an example it's like if I'm thinking yeah it's been a while you know one of them goes like it's been a while that I called my mom I should I should call my mom 
And then another one goes like, yeah, but you know, this is gonna be long, so let's make coffee first. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna make coffee. I put a mug in the machine. And then another one goes like, hey, but today's the first of the month. Have you paid the rent? Oh yeah, dude, I should, I should double check that. So then I open my phone because I'm gonna check like my banking app and then I see a notification from someone else. So then another voice comes in and they're like, yeah, you should text like your friend. And then I'm like, oh yeah, we're supposed to have dinner tonight. And I forgot to tell them. And so, you know, it's just constant noise and I constantly jump from one thing to the other without doing the first thing. So at the end of the process, I never call my mom. My coffee's cold and it's waiting for me and I forgot about it. I never checked if I paid the rent, so I may not have checked and you know, I'll receive like a remainder 20 days and you know, it's, it's, it's constantly like that in every situation. So although I may look calm, there's so much stuff going on in my head constantly that it's super hard for me to pay attention. And yeah, like sometimes people are talking to me and they think I pay attention, but actually I'm not listening at all. And I wonder how it shows, it probably does. Another misconception is we think that people with ADHD cannot focus. Yes, I mean attentive, but I actually can concentrate and focus sometimes. I mean, I wish someone had told me this earlier because when I started thinking maybe I have ADHD, I was thinking it cannot be ADHD because I can concentrate. I went to college and I graduated, you know, so I, I can focus sometimes. But yeah, it's just that this is what my focus pattern looks. Other one day, either I cannot do anything, so nothing will get done. Other the next day, I managed to do 40 hours of work in eight hours. That means I'm in hyper-focus. Hyper-focus is a very high level of concentration that you can, even neurotypicals can get to that state but it's, it just happens way more often for, for, for us. Or I can do you know four hours of work at a random moment of the day when my brain decides it wanna work. So you know, it's more a matter of inconsistency, meaning some days, some days I can't do anything, some days I can't pay attention at all, some days I'm like super, I'm like so focused that I cannot do anything else. So, yeah, it's, it's really a matter of imbalance, really. And actually, that's what makes us seem lazy because, you know, if one day I show up to work and I do eight hours, Monday, and then Tuesday I show up, like, yeah, can't get anything done. If you're my boss, you're gonna think, yeah, what's your problem? Like, you don't wanna work today? And, and I'm like, yeah, it's not that I, I, I don't want to, it's I can't, but, it's hard to believe when the other days you can work normally to some degree. Moving on, motivation, well, same problem. It's either I have zero motivation to do anything, either I'm hyper motivated and that's the only thing I think about and I get super upset. So if I don't have motivation, that means it's not gonna get done. So this happens, you know, with boring tasks. Um, Tasks that require like a long and sustained mental effort. Like for example, doing my tax declaration. You know, nobody likes doing their tax declaration as far as I know, but if you have ADHD, like <laughs> I ask all the possible delays and then literally at the last minute once, you know, it's like I have to submit it in a week and now I really have to do something urgent, then I can actually start doing it. Um, and I will do it all in a short period of time in hyper-focus. And during that time, well, it's like, I can't stop. Those five voices in my head are finally gonna start working. I'm gonna think about everything and I'm gonna have, you know, the accounting of the entire year done in like two days. So that's my productive productivity process, really. Memory, well, I don't have, I have a very bad working memory. <laughs> but I mean, of course, if you're talking to me and I'm not paying attention, I don't hear it. So I can't remember it if I didn't hear it in the first, you know, in the first place. Um, and yeah, I do forget a lot of stuff. I forget appointments. Um, sometimes I even forget I had dinners with friends, plans. So 
it creates problems in my relationship because they think I don't care about them, you know, but it's not the case. I just, there's so much stuff going on in my head that if I forget to put something in my calendar on that moment, I will forget forever and I will forget about the dinner altogether. Emotions. We struggle to regulate our emotions. So this leads us to have, uh, to feel intense emotions, pretty much all of them. Um, but we can also have intense emotional reactions, anger, for example. Um, they're not random, you know, like I can get like super angry at something, but it's not like completely random. Like, so I had to go through the process of thinking once I got diagnosed, I had to, to think about what are the triggers that, you know, can make me angry and now I can communicate better, you know. Actually, you know, I'm autistic and I can compromise on a lot of things, but not this one. So if you put this thing somewhere else, it will distress me and I might react, you know, I, I might get upset. And actually, this is one of the reasons why as women, we tend to be diagnosed with other things. Um, because I feel like, we live in a place where it's okay for men to have anger outbursts, but not really for women. So when you go see a professional and you tell them, yeah, when my mom moves my stuff, it pisses me off and I go crazy, they will be tempted to tag you with a mental illness. They won't think about ADHD at first. And that's what happened to me. Um, first, I was diagnosed with uh, general, generalized anxiety disorder and then with borderline personality disorder like most women I know who have ADHD here were diagnosed with that at first so there's definitely a pattern here and then a few other common behaviors that people with ADHD show exercising a lot that's my case I do CrossFit almost every day any idea why we exercise a lot no? Tell me. That's a good one. Not exactly the answer I was looking for, yeah? <laughs> exactly. It gives us a dopamine boost. Exercising raises your, gives you a, a boost of dopamine, which is what we crave, so it's very addictive because we, we lack it, so we, we, you know, we seek it. And also, it also gives you a boost of serotonin and other things, but in our case, it's really the dopamine that we're, you know, that we need. Eating a lot of sugary food, any idea why? Dopamine. dopamine. Drinking a lot of coffee. Honestly, I think I drink more coffee in a day than anybody here in a week, I'm, sh I'm sure. Any idea why? Dopamine. Other thing, we often have like, we often discover like a new passion out of nowhere and we get super obsessed about it. So my new passion is DJing. Um, so right now I'm like super obsessed about it. Like I, I started DJing like maybe a few weeks ago and I'm completely obsessed about it. That's all I do on weekend, you know. But before that, there was another thing that I gave up. And before that, there was another thing that I gave up. So it's like I have a cemetery of like, passions they're like somewhere so you know if in three months you ask me yeah how's the DJing going I'll be like oh. <laughs> right now I'm interested in <laughs> paleontology or <laughs> anything else um, so yeah it seems that my brain you know is either completely uninterested or obsessed so again it's very uh, unbalanced it's like it's like I kind of go from one extreme to the other yeah, let's talk about how that can make me more creative. <laughs> so first, what is creativity? I mean, there are so many definitions. The one that I like the most is this one, meaning that it's a process where you can connect two things that seem unrelated. Um, I like to define it like that because it means it's a process and it can be learned and you can become better at it. You don't need to have ADHD, ADHD to have good ideas, you know? You can train your brain to make connections between things that seem unrelated. So here's an example of an idea I had in my business. A couple of years ago, I introduced a new product called the half price card. So it was a physical card that you could buy 
and it was valid for one full year and um, it would give you the right to purchase any phones that you wanted at 50% off, so at half price. Does that ring a bell to you? This idea comes from the Swiss railway half price card. So you know, you know this, this, this card, right? You can purchase it and then during a year you buy any train ticket at half the price. So it's exactly the same concept. So it's like people in my field told me that this was such a visionary idea and you should have thought about it earlier. And I just feel guilty because I just, you know, stole the idea from the train that I take every day and I just reused it in my industry. Um, yeah, so that's what I mean by connecting things that seem unrelated. You can use an idea in the train in, in your business. Other ways that I actually get ideas, well, I get <laughs> five people talking in my head. So, you know, in a day, I generate more ideas and thoughts than any neurotypical does. So it's just a matter of quantity, you know? On the total, some of them have to be good ideas. Another point is, as I said, I change hobbies very frequently. I, I have a new hobby, I'm over passionate about it and I wanna learn everything and I learn super fast because that's all I do. Right now it's DJing, but you know, there was when I was little, I was obsessed with dinosaurs. So ask me anything about dinosaurs, happy to talk about it. I also had a phase where I was obsessed with Vikings, so I learned so much about Scandinavian history and like the gods and their culture and folklore. Um, so of course, as a result, I have so much knowledge in my head, like so much things, that it's kind of easier to associate different things if I kind of, you know, if I have like this broad range of things to pick from. And also, Despite, despite the fact that apparently it's smaller, the neurodivergent brain can store more information than a neuro neurotypical brain. So not only we kind of know more things, maybe they're completely random, but we know them anyways, but also our brain is hyperactive. So it's like a computer, you know, this happens also in a, in a neuro normal brain, but it happens faster for us. Our brain is constantly trying to connect things together. So since it happens faster and we have more things to connect, it's easier for us to connect things that seem unrelated. Also, <laughs> I feel like everybody today is just trying to come up with ways to be more productive. You know, there are so many books on how to develop good habits and be more productive. But I've read them all and none of them help. So I know my level of productivity is very low and I know it's not gonna help. So as a result, I have to constantly seek ways, like I need to constantly find productivity hacks. So it's like I've trained my creative side to find ways to hack my productivity. And often people think that, you know, creativity and productivity are very opposed. One is like brainstorming and one is just putting everything into order and having it done. But in fact, I don't think it is. I think you can try and train your brain to come up with the best way to do anything and try, um, how can I say that? Try to work smarter rather than harder, which in my case is kind of a life of death situation because I, I can't work that much. Um, also, I came across this quote. Um, it's from the book Creative Confidence, which actually is one of the gifts brought it, that you can win. Uh, and basically, the theory of these guys is that creativity and innovation, you know, the more you use them, it's like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets and the better you get at it. So if that's true, you know, for me, that that muscle is super strong because I've always had to come up with solutions to problems that it seemed I was the only person facing until I was diagnosed with ADHD last year. But you know, I was 36, so it's like all my life, I was struggling with so many things that I had to, you know, come up with solution. So I guess in a way, since I've been doing this all my life, it has become a bit easier.
Another thing I wanted to mention is what's called the ADHD sixth sense. Uh, it's not really linked to generating ideas, but as I said, our brain can store more information. So we just have, we're just more intuitive because um, in any situation, it's like our brain sees more things and stores it. So we just have more input. So as a result, it's kind of easier for us. Like we have a better instinct about what could be a good idea in your business or what could not be. And also because of that, often we're a very good judge of character. Like we can tell even if other people cannot, if there are very little things that seem off about someone. And sometimes we take 10 years until we notice what the problem was, but we just have like a bit of a stronger instinct for certain things. Um, creative problem solving. So I think it's also so a skill that is underestimated. Um, a cool thing about having ADHD, I need to bring up cool things, you know, because it, it's really daunting some days, but in some other days it's a superpower, you know? So I just, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> represent the ADHDers here. Another cool thing is that in a situation of crisis, for example, if you witness uh, a bike accident, someone getting hit by a car. Well, most neurotypical people will panic and freeze, which is a totally normal reaction. But for me, actually this happened before. It gives me a boost of dopamine. So suddenly it's like I'm calm and I can think clearly. And now all those, you know, CPR things that I've learned like in high school that nobody remembers, they just come to me. That's the five guys talking together. And, and now I'm like, no, 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 you should, you should move this person, you know, like, because you, you can do like, um, I can't remember how it's called. Anyways, those things just come back to me naturally and I know what to do and I'm gonna design some, designate someone to call an ambulance, someone very specific, and then I'm, I know what, what I'm supposed to do. So, you know, we are better at, at finding, you know, creative solutions to problems just because in times of really bad problems, we are, co we are cool, you know, whereas everybody is just panicking. So if I can give a piece of advice to you, you know, make sure you have at least one friend who has ADHD, <laughs> just in case, you know, a zombie apocalypse shows up. If anybody survives, it will be us, <laughs> I'm sure. Another cool fact I like, people with ADHD are 300% more likely to be entrepreneurs. That's my case. That's the case of most people I know who have ADHD. It's not a surprise. For me, it's because I make a terrible employee. <laughs> I mean, being expected to have your brain work between nine to five, I can't do it. Just even respecting showing up on time and remember, I have, you know, remembering I have a meeting. So I make a terrible employee. Nobody wants me as an employee. So of course I work alone, but it's also because it gives us so much, like we are naturally creative. We have so many thoughts and we have more thoughts that we can pursue. So when you work for yourself, you know, you have a context where you're given this creative freedom, where you can pursue your own ideas. You can pursue your hobby that you love so much beside work. And you can use some of the things you learn in, in your job, you know, which when you have a regular job is way harder to do. So I've been run running a business for seven years now. Um, and you know, I think creativity is the ultimate business advantage because when you run a business, you constantly need to ask yourself, what can I do better? Uh, what new product can I bring to the market? You also need to anticipate what changes are might be coming to the market. And you know, those things are, things that people with ADHD are just good at. We're, we're good at having a vision, terrible at executing it. Like I know what we're supposed to do. I'm just really bad at doing it. But now I know, so I can be the boss and I get other people to do the stuff I cannot get done, like my tax declaration and my accounting, you know? And um, it's funny because during that time, a few years after I started my business, some other guys started one that was the same thing, exactly the same idea. And I didn't take it bad because I was like, you wanna copy me? 
go ahead. Today, I'm going to launch something new that you have no idea about. It comes from the train, but nobody knows. And actually, they lasted five years, and they just announced a few weeks ago that they were out of business because they couldn't find a way to make money out of their business, which I do. So to me, it's proof that actually ADHD is the ultimate business advantage. So yeah, thank you for listening, guys. <laughs>
Yeah, that's a good question. So first, I have a background in marketing. I went to a business school, I'm not sure how I graduated. Ah, well, <laughs> I cheated on all the math exams because I'm terrible at math. It's, it's very common as people with ADHD. The more steps there are, less over, the more overwhelmed we are. So anyway, so I have a, a business background, um, but I was always very interested in design. That was one of my obsession at some point, and so was typography. And um, I also knew that I needed to, like I wanted to build, at the time I wanted to build an e-commerce, because I thought that's easy. Orders come in, I ship stuff, no problem. I can do that, or pay someone else to do that. And um, in the process, I knew that I needed to have an email newsletter that was very interesting and not only about my business, but about something different so that I could grow an audience and keep them aware of my brand and what I'm doing. And um, so I joined a few communities of designers online. One of them is called French Designers Club. It's run by a friend of mine now. Uh, and I noticed that one thing they were sharing often were new fonts. So I thought, ah, oh, that's interesting, meaning designers are interested in learning about new fonts. So maybe my newsletter can be about that. So I made what we call a smoke test. I made a um, sign up page. There was no newsletter, but you it said, this is a newsletter with you know curated new font. You can sign up if you're interested, just to see if people were interested really. And a lot of people were. <laughs> I was like, wow, there's not even a problem. Now I need to you know, make a newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know anything about fonts, but I learned it on the way. So that's how I validated this need, really, by doing a smoke test and seeing that hundreds of people, you know, I just made this web page, see if people would sign up, shared it a little bit on the web, and then overnight, I think I had 500 people. And I was like, oh, that's pretty good for a start. You cannot even see an email. So, that's how I was like, okay, you know, this might be a good idea, let's start. And, and well, you know, I've been doing this for seven years now with a lot of improvements and adding products on the way because you don't, I don't make money from the newsletter itself, so I had to figure out ways. Does that answer the question? Yes. Cool. <laughs> uh, can I ask how you diagnose yourself or got diagnosed uh, that you have a GAG yeah, and how, uh, how can you be sure you have this? Oh, I got diagnosed now. I have an official diagnosis. <laughs> but I've known for a while, even before I got the official diagnosis. Actually, <laughs> it's a funny story. I, um, I started dating someone who's a therapist and <laughs> <laughs> productivity hack. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, I mean, um, therapy hack. You get therapy for free at home. Um, and she, huh? Yeah, poor her, we broke up. Um, but she used to tell, she would tell me, it's funny, you keep jumping from one conversation to the other, like your mind is like all over the place. And she noticed other things in me that are very common symptoms of ADHD. So she told me, you probably, you know, you might want to check. I think you might have ADHD. And actually, I took a little bit of offense because I was like, what do you mean I have ADHD? Because I changed the subject. Everybody does that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, attemptive, but in other situation, I can focus, you know, I graduated college. So, but then I started, um, following accounts on Instagram that talk about it. I know it sounds silly, it's not a very good source of information, but actually some accounts are really good. And then the more and more symptoms they were sharing, the more I was like, wow, <laughs> you know what? These are all the things that are wrong with me. <laughs> like the anxiety, sleep issues, m struggle to pay attention, eat a lot of sugar. And, and more and more and more and more and more. And I was just like, wow, actually, actually, this is my problem. She was right. And, and then I went to seek, at first, it was here, it was last year. I went to see a psychiatrist to get a diagnosis, which was a terrible idea. Because psychiatrists diagnose mental illnesses. And as I said, ADHD is not. So if you go see a psych, you're sleeping. I have issues to pay attention, 
also I'm a woman, that doesn't help. They will tell you, oh, you probably have like an anxiety disorder that caused the inattention, which is the opposite of the problem I have. So I should have gone seen a neuropsychologist. It's those people who do like all the tests and who can diagnose autism and ADHD and all those things. So that's what I did after. And I eventually got a diagnosis. But it's thanks to this girl I dated. <laughs> so thank you if you're listening. <laughs> No, th that they don't use MRI to, to do diagnosis yet. They are just doing research on that, but unfortunately they cannot use that. Um, like it's not reliable enough at the moment to be used uh, in diagnosis. I really hope one day it will be because it would remove so many bias from the communication you have with a psychiatrist. It's like, no, it's not an anxiety disorder. Look at my brain. It's smaller. Everything's wrong in it, man. Like. Uh, because it was really daunting for me. The psychiatrist actually diagnosed me with um, borderline personality disorder. And I was shocked. He didn't even explain to me what it was. But then I started learning about it and I was like, it makes no sense. It makes no sense to me. I do have like one or two symptoms, but not enough to say that's my problem. And actually, of the probably 30 women that I know who have ADHD, because I, I, I run um, like a group of women and non-binary people. There are so men in the group, but anyways, to talk about women, half of them who were diagnosed with ADHD were diagnosed with borderline personality disorder in the first time. So it's really a problem. Women get misdiagnosed a lot. And, and it has huge consequences because then we don't get medication. We don't have access to medication unless you are diagnosed with ADHD. So you have to deal with all that stuff on your own. Um, you don't get the support you need from you know, someone who's specialized. And um, it's really sad, but as a result, I saw that in the UK, they estimate that one woman out of four that was diagnosed with ADHD try to take her own life at some point in her life. And in women who were never diagnosed, which is a huge batch of them, it's probably one out of two. So this whole, like, the fact that they do so much research on men, and so they know how those present symptoms, symptoms present in men, and diagnosis tool, like the tools they use for diagnosis are biased. So they don't take into account how the symptoms that women have that men actually, like for example, men usually present with physical hyperactivity. So when you have a little boy that's hyperactive, that's usually when the parents are like, hmm, it might be a case of ADHD. When you're a girl and you're super calm, it doesn't happen. So it comes way later in life. But the mean meaning, because they do research on men, they only know symptoms in men. And even the tools they use for diagnosis are biased for us. And it creates a lot of problems. That's why I really hope one day they can just use, you know, brain imaging. It would be so easier. Sorry, I even forgot the question. <laughs> no, it's okay. Does that answer it? Yeah. Anyways. yeah. <laughs> it does. Yeah, you can give me the mic. Uh, I'm in the process of self-diagnosing right ah, now. Ah, good luck. <laughs> Don't go see a psychiatrist. I won't. <laughs> but there's something you said that really resonated with my experience. I'm Dutch originally, and I was a a very good lifeguard because when shit hit the fan yeah you stay I calm. got the overview and I could deal with the whole situation no matter whether there were 20 different factors but then I got home and I got rested and I got this brain cinema just driving me crazy how do you deal with those after effects if you have them well <laughs> I do, I know what you mean. Like, it's like your brain keep rehearsing the same situation over and over and over and over again. And it doesn't, for me, it doesn't only happen with a situation that was a crisis. It can also happen with conversations. You know, sometimes I just, I had a conversation with someone and maybe I got upset and I keep thinking about it in a fucking loop and it never stops. And I'm like, I should have told him this or I should have told him that. And it never ends. But I had, to be honest, I haven't really found a solution for that. So I, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, probably the only thing that 
I found that helps me calm my mind is an app called Endo, and it plays noise. And I think you use you you, you know it. Not that one, but I, I know the guy who um, who recommends it. And it used like uh, <laughs> you, you you what? Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. The vacuum cleaner from YouTube. Or the rain. I, I don't know that one, but yeah, it's a bit the same the same thing. So you can pick from different like noise, like one helps you fall asleep, that really helps me. Because at night I have the same problem, like my thoughts are racing and I can't stop thinking and I, I have an idea for the presentation I need to give in two days. So I have to wake up and write it down because otherwise I forget. So it's a nightmare to fall asleep. Um, and so yeah, those, those calming sounds, I try to really focus on them and it helps calm down the rest of my brain. But it's hard, like, I guess with time I'll get better at it, but I don't really have a productivity hack for that. There's also one in the background. It's not necessarily easy, but it didn't seem too hard. My first thing, I just want to, before my question, I just want to react with, um, to what was just said. Um, as for myself, when I, I do have diagnosed ADHD, um, when I have the, this kind of um, overwhelming feeling of a rush after a very um, Stressful situation. intense yeah. situation, um, it's not a definitive uh, solution, but having some physical activity like walking uh, or cleaning stuff up and gradually decreasing the intensity yeah. of the thing is kind of a helpful tool. Um, my question was, you said the, the, there's a lack of motivation for certain activities, but what's the place of uh, discipline in your life for... Where I show the most lack of motivation? No, but I mean, what's, how do you, because for myself, regarding physical, um, act, like sports, I enjoy sports uh, like, like you do, but uh, sometimes I, I just don't want to do, like, Earlier on, I was working on something. I was being productive, and uh, it was the time to go work out. And I forced myself to go work out. And now I'm able to have that discipline. But uh, do, do you find discipline useful, or do you just try to be motivated before doing something? Well, to be fair, I don't really have the problem. I love CrossFit so much. It, it's been a hyper Like, I've been obsessed about it. When I started it, I wanted to know everything about it. And I was annoying all the coaches, because I was like, I want you to correct me. I want my technique to be perfect. I want to know the most efficient way to do every movement, even a push-up. Teach me how to do a push-up, you know? So I, the motivation has gone down a little bit, but actually when I wake up in the morning, I feel like a complete zombie. And then when I drink seven coffee and I'm starting to feel alive a little bit, the first thing I want to do is go to CrossFit because I know, it, like, I just... It has such an imp it's like taking medication for me. So I depend on it so much and when I get out of it, I feel so much better and more focused that I'm so addicted to it that I don't really have a, it's, I think it's the only thing that I consist consistently do is to go to CrossFit. And I'm, so far I haven't lacked motivation really. You can come with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll actually, teach you how actually, to do push-ups. I, I, I know I everything yeah. now. I got way, into, way too much into weightlifting about a year ago, and I injured myself, so... Well, you why. see, you should have learned the technique from the start. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> you, <laughs> Merci. Uh, what do you mean by when you say that the uh, ADHD is not a mental illness, mm. even though the DSM-5 categorizes it as a mental disorder? Do you mean something different by mental illness and mental disorder? What do you mean? Me yeah, mental disorder for me sounds like neurological condition. But to me, they're different from an illness because an illness is something you develop. So, for example, depression, very common. But you know you're not born with depression and it doesn't show in your brain that you're lacking. Well, actually, maybe yes. But anyways, um, a mental illness is something that you develop in a specific situation or following a trope. I think, because I'm not a therapist, but as far as I know, <laughs> please double check that. Um, you develop mental illness following a trauma. 
it's like a trauma response or you get depressed because you lack things in your life. So it's more like passager, like usually with therapy and good things, you can, you can cure it and grow out of it. But ADHD and autism are not like, your brain just uh, developed differently and now it's like this. So you can't do anything about it. You just have to, you know, deal with it. So the key difference is that it's innate and there is no uh, cure. Exactly. Right. Yep. It's a permanent condition mm -hmm. if you want. Got it. Thank you. So last question is from the stream. Uh, someone asks you... Who's the someone? I don't have the name. Oh. So <laughs> I, uh, I have a number, so oh, maybe 620 asked. Uh, just have to find the question now. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Did receiving the ADHD di diagnosis affect you, your work-life balance, and how? How does it affect you to how receive it the diagnosis? Me? Yeah. I didn't, sorry, I didn't hear the second part of the yeah. question. Yeah, how it affects your work-life balance to... My work-life balance? Yeah. I mean, my work-life balance <laughs> was never one to begin with. Before I walk in. Um, you got diagnosed years ago. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you how it affected me. Yeah, actually it's funny because my little sister got diagnosed as well and for her, um, anyways, sorry, I can't remember what she said. Um, it really, me, for me it was a huge slap in the face because I was like, wow. I noticed I was a little bit off, but I didn't realize I had like such a, for me, it felt really heavy. I felt like I was, you know, like autistic, like someone completely different. Like, like, I don't know, like I belong in a complete, I don't know, I felt like I was really not normal. I, I felt a little bit like an alien, to be honest. So it was not easy for me to accept. And it's still kind of a process. Um, yeah, and now I'm, like I talk with my, f because all my close friends have it too, <laughs> which is funny. Once you realize you have ADHD, you actually realize that most of your close friends have it too, even if you didn't know. It's like, we just understand each other, even if we don't know because it's why, but you know, we just think alike and we get along. So it's like, anyways, so they tell me, you know, it's not a big deal. And I, I'm trying to make fun of it and not see it as a big deal, that it's getting easier, but at first it was really hard. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Okay. Does it? Yeah, so thank you. Now we're doing the approach. It's okay for you. Thank you very much, Naomi, for the Well, oh, you're welcome, guys. Oh, let's do the quiz now.